Good evening, everybody, and a very warm welcome to this Goldsmiths Centre talk. It is fantastic to have so many of you. Goodness me, the figures are jumping up. Um, this is officially our largest ever public programme event. My name is Charlotte Dew and I'm the Public Programme Manager at the Goldsmith Centre. So it, it's my pleasure to welcome Jason Sandy and um, Nick Stevens, both mudlarks. Well, good evening, everyone. It's very nice to be here, even though we can't see you. Um, I hope that uh, you enjoy tonight's lecture. Uh, so my, my name is Jason and Nick, I think you see on the screen below me or above me. Hi. <laughs> and uh, we are, or I am an architect, and Nick is a professional photographer, and mudlarking is our hobby, but it's uh, an all-encompassing hobby, and uh, they call our wives Thames widows, because we're never home, we're always mudlarking. Um, so I, we just wanted to share with you initially just a bit of background information about mudlarking, the Thames, the context, the historical background, and then Nick is going to share some of his best finds with you. And then because we are speaking to the Goldsmith Center tonight, uh, we're going to share some of the best gold finds that have been found in the Thames. And I must say, uh, it's extremely rare to find gold in the Thames, so don't get your hopes up. And just as a caveat before we begin, uh, to mudlark along the River Thames in London, everyone must have a permit, regardless of even if you're uh, walking around, not disturbing the surface, not scraping, not digging, not metal detecting, everyone must have a, a license. Uh, to obtain a license, you would need to go to the Port of London Authority's website, download the application form, and pay a, a fee. Uh, to, to have the license. The reason why I wanted to show you this satellite photo is just to show you how close the English Channel is to central London. So it's just a short journey up the River Thames uh, to reach central London. And this is the mouth of the river here where it disperses and dispenses into the English Channel, uh, which is called the Thames Estuary. As we zoom into central London, you can see some of the main highlights. Uh, Canary Wharf is right in this uh, location here. Historic Greenwich is down at the bottom of the horseshoe. Uh, and this is the River Thames that does a nice, beautiful curve through central London. Uh, we've got Tower Bridge located here. Uh, we've got Millennium Bridge here in the center. And then again, Goldsmith Center, which is uh, a bit, bit north of the river, and you can see a small green dot there, which I'll zoom in, but this is Smithfield's Market here, and this is the, uh, the new location of the Museum of London, which they're currently working on. So that just kind of gives you a, a brief glimpse of where we are in terms of London, where the river's located, and it really is, the river is the beating heart of London. And the whole reason that uh, London exists is because of the River Thames. Uh, so the civilization uh, was first started back in 43 AD when the Romans arrived. They, they attempted previously to start a settlement in the uh, London area back in around uh, 55 uh, BC, but weren't successful until 43 AD. And it started off just as a trading center uh, along the river. And as that grew, this is several hundred, well, a thousand years later, but this is old London Bridge. And you can see just uh, how much the city has grown in just a very short amount of time. Uh, so the Romans were here until about 420, 430 AD. And then we had the Anglo-Saxons that came in, Vikings, uh, and then it moved into the medieval period. So as you can imagine, over those thousands of years of history, almost 2,000 years, a lot of things have been dropped into the river. Uh, so this uh, bridge that you see here, the old London Bridge, this was the only bridge over the River Thames for over 600 years. So that meant that a lot of people to get across from one side of the river to the next would need to hop in a boat. And as you can imagine, with the uh, tide coming in and out, the slippery rocks, the, the cobblestone streets, uh, people would slip, things would fall out of their pockets and would fall into the Thames. And that's why we mudlarks always look at ferry points to see where those people were getting in and out of boats, just because obviously were, they were dropping things in that area. London was also the largest port in the world back in the uh, 18th and 19th century. And again, most of the cargo arriving from the British colonies and from around the globe 
was arriving in London. And of course, there were other ports around England and the United Kingdom, but London was the largest port at that time. Uh, the largest actually in the world. So you have all of these seagoing vessels that are sailing up the Thames um, and they were uh, unloading their cargo, loading uh, cargo to take abroad. And as they were doing that, obviously things were being also dropped into the river. The, the river was so congested with boats and there were warehouses along the river for 11 continuous miles uh, within London. So you can imagine uh, all of that uh, activity along the river. And they said that the river was so congested with boats that you could pretty much hop from boat to boat and cross the river without uh, getting your feet wet. So mudlarks, uh, the term comes uh, from the Victorian times. Uh, and primarily they were young children, um, very poor members of society, and even older women that would go down. And literally they were just going down at low tide, searching for anything that was of any value at all. They weren't looking for gold or silver coins. They were looking for coal, rope, chains, uh, especially any shipbuilding or shipbreaking tools, anything that they could uh, immediately re resell and uh, gain some money to go buy a loaf of bread or even to support their families. Uh, they said that the, the uh, mud that they went through and the, um, obviously they weren't bathing regularly, a lot of their clothes were so stiff they could barely move because they were so muddy and the mud had dried over um, yeah, many days of, of going down. So they really were the poorest members of society back in Victorian times. Nowadays, it's much different. Uh, we like to consider ourselves to be amateur archeologists. We're going down there because we love history. We love discovering something new and touching something uh, that somebody hasn't seen or touched in over a thousand years. That's really the thrill of mudlarking. So as you go down, and I'm just gonna take you on a brief tour down on the foreshore uh, since we're uh, in a digital environment and you can't go down there yourself, but uh, it really is uh, an eclectic mix of different things. This is a view of the Thames in my local area where I live in Chiswick, which is in West London, Hammersmith area. And you can see a small island here, which is separated by two bits of the river at high tide. But at low tide, you can see how dramatically the, the water level drops. It's roughly the, the, the height of a two-story building, roughly about seven meters high, uh, uh, sorry, height, that it drops uh, twice a day. Um, between high tide and low tide. I did the same illustration uh, in central London. This is Millennium Bridge and over to the right hand side, I'm not sure if you can see it, is the Globe Theatre. Uh, also the Tate Modern Gallery is on my right hand side. And again, this is almost at high tide and then this is the low tide line. So vast amounts of, uh, of the foreshore, the riverbed are exposed at low tide. And that's when we go searching for these uh, historical artifacts that are just, uh, that, that were dropped uh, centuries, even millennia ago. Two years ago, I was out night larking. And sometimes because of these super low tides at night, we go out um, around midnight. Again, it depends on the, the tides. Uh, the low tide time, um, and I stumbled upon this beautiful cut garnet, which is extremely rare uh, on the River Thames. I took it to the uh, Victorian Albert Museum in central London, and they uh, identified it for me, and it's actually a uh, Hessenite garnet from Sri Lanka, and it weighs 8.2 carats. So that was quite a whopping find. Normally these garnets are quite small that we find. This is just a scale comparison showing you the normal uncut garnets that we find uh, juxtaposed against the uh, cut garnet that I found uh, two years ago. So uh, one of my Instagram followers saw this on uh, uh, in a post that I posted on Instagram and offered to make a, a beautiful pendant necklace for my wife for our anniversary uh, last year. And I was absolutely chuffed when I opened this box and saw this beautiful uh, piece of gold jewelry, gold necklace. Um, and this was done by Ruth Patterson up in Scotland, um, which was a very nice gesture. Hi. So I'm going to run through uh, five of my most favorite finds. So um, basically my interest in mudlarking, I guess, has stemmed from my love of fossil hunting. Um, as, a, as a child, I, was, I just loved looking for fossils, trips to the Jurassic Coast in Dorset. So when I stumbled upon 
this item on the foreshore, I had a pretty good idea what it was. It was pretty self-explanatory as being a tooth of some description, but I really didn't have any idea where it was from, what, what kind of animal it was from. So um, once I got home, a little bit of research, I quite quickly stumbled upon um, some similarities and it was in fact uh, a tooth from a megalodon which um, was a huge prehistoric shark. It's part of the shark species. Um, and it dates from around 16, 16 million to two and a half million years old. Um, the Megalodon was a huge prehistoric shark, um, had about 10 tons worth of biting force, uh, grew to a length of about 18 meters, um, would have eaten uh, whales, dolphins, and turtles for breakfast. Um, and at the time, I remember thinking, is this possible that this creature lived? Is this native to Britain or has this come from a, an, another country? And I was very surprised to, to, to find that it was. This, this creature it used to swim around um, the coast of Britain uh, during warmer climates. Um, unfortunately, it likely became extinct during um, um, the, the Ice Age when the temperatures dropped. Um, it's used to warm climates and um, yeah, lack of food resources. Um, a lot of the its food source went on to warmer climates um, and and yeah so it kind of it wasn't able to survive um, so that was my best uh, best fossil find so moving on we have this object which I don't know if anybody you can, can recognize it straight away for me I kind of knew what that was this the split second I saw it it's been very high on my on my finds list at that time um, and it is a flint axe or rather it's the flint adds so there's a difference between an adz and an axe. An adz um, cuts, uh, uh, cuts sideways, where an axe will cut lengthways. So an axe like that, an adz is cut like that. Um, and it's called a Thames pick. The style and the shape um, is known, it's categorized as a Thames pick, um, which means basically it's native to the Thames Valley, um, which also suggests basically that it was, I like to say, owned by one of the very first Londoners. So it's, it's from the Mesolithic period, Mesolithic meaning Middle Stone Age, and is approximately 11,000 years old. Um, it would have been hafted, which means it would have been um, attached to a wooden, you know, kind of wooden handle, and would have been uh, attached using some sort of twine um, glue made from, from deer hide, uh, and would have been used to build shelters, uh, chop wood for fuel, um, that kind of thing. Was it lost? Maybe it was dropped, maybe it was votive as well. We find a lot of artifacts that could possibly have been votive. So, you know, you might have placed that in the water and, you know, wished for good crops or, you know, whatever, whatever you wished for. So that might have been the reason that it, that it was put into the river. So I will never forget the feeling of picking it up and holding it in my hand. And just for, that, just for that moment, trying to imagine who that the last person was to have held that in their hand all those years ago. And just try and imagine, you know, how the world was, how, how, what were they seeing, what were they experiencing, what was life like for them, you know? So this, um, quite a lot to look at here. So on the top left is the actual find that I made. And this is, is what we call what's known as a, as a 17th century trader's token. So during this period, 17th century, there wasn't enough copper, copper coinage, copper, raw copper to make coinage. Um, so the government at the time issued permissions for tradesmen, uh, uh, token makers to create, make tokens that were official coinage and they were allowed to be used um, by businesses because basically the government just couldn't produce enough copper farthings and half pennies. Um, this token is known uh, and the reason why this is such an, an exciting and an interesting token is because it's from Pudding Lane, um, obviously where the Great Fire of London uh, started. It's also dated as well. If you can see in the top left-hand corner, it uh, says 1657. So um, do your math. That's nine years before the Great Fire of London. Um, B-A-W, so translating those initials, um, that was a chap called Brian Appleby. Um, the W, I have literally two days ago, I was, I was told what the W stood for, and this was Brian's wife, who has the name was called Winifruit which is now my most favourite name in the world. I love it. Winifred, what a fantastic name. Uh, Brian Appleby was a vintner, um, and he provided made wine for sale in London, but also he owned um, a tavern called the Maidenhead. So the reverse of the coin, it says, at ye Maidenhead. 
um, and that was his tavern where he sold his wine. Um, from research, we also know that Brian Appleby uh, issued a token in 1668, which uh, is good news for Brian and, and Winifred because that meant that they survived the Great Fire uh, and so did their business. Um, yeah, what a find. So then moving on to the next find and probably um, one of the most impressive images uh, that you're likely to see. And this is um, my, um, my, well, one of, another one of my most greatest finds. Uh, this was just an ordinary evening. I'm out with uh, my dog, Stolly. I don't know if you, if any of you watched the show Mud Men that we did many years ago. She was, uh, she was uh, my sidekick on that show. So uh, me and Stolly were out for an evening walk uh, one evening and, and I literally stumbled upon what you see right now. I literally walked upon this. Um, you know, I didn't know, oh my God, what am I looking at? Is this real? Is this, is this, you know, is this fake? Is it whatever? I don't know. So I kind of bent down, gave it a tap and a touch and just thought, geez, this is, this is the real deal. So, so then I thought I need to ring the police. So I rang the police and they said, okay, you found some bones. Well, you know, there's lots of bones on the foreshore. It's pro probably just an animal bone. I had to explain that. I'm looking at a skull. It's not a bone. It's a skull. It's a real skull. I need some help. So they said, okay, where are you? So I was able to say, okay, yeah, to the police. I'm outside this particular wharf on the foreshore. Okay, so if you could wait there, we'll send someone very quickly. And I said, look, the tide has turned. We haven't got much time, but we'll get there as quickly as we can. Uh, so I'm waiting for a couple of minutes and I thought, yeah, the tide is going to come in and cover this up. I need to do something. So I looked around for a long piece of anything, found a piece of metal and I went and put it in the mud just above where the skull is. Um, so um, so it, it would hopefully be marked if the tide came in, which is what happened by the time they came down onto the foreshore, three, three police officers. It was all covered up and they said, okay, Sonny, we know what these bones you found. Um, and I basically showed them that picture that I'd taken on my, on my old Nokia phone. And they were like, as you'd imagine, oh my God, well, where is it? So I pointed to the piece of metal that was sticking out the top of the water and said, it's over there. Um, we all looked at each other's footwear um, and they looked back at me and I'm like, okay, well, you've got shoes on, I've got my wellies. I'll do it. So I waded out into the water, plunged my arm into, into the water and felt around until I found the skull and uh, almost like picking up a bowling ball, uh, two fingers in the eye sockets, one in the jaw, plucked it out of the mud. Um, as, I, as I walked back to the forensics chap who had his bag open, I realized that the jaw had come away. So I said, the jaw has come away. And they said, uh, well, it doesn't matter. We've got all we need. And I'm thinking, yeah, but it needs to be with it, really. Don't worry, listen, I'm going to go back and get it. No, 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 don't, you don't need to do that. I'm like, no, I'm going to go back. I'm going to go back. So I went back, felt around for something jaw-like, uh, picked it up, and it was amazingly, came back, popped it all in the bag, they zipped it up, and off they went, and that was it. Um, a couple of days later, I managed to get hold of the, the station and speak to a chap who was dealing with it, and they said they needed to look into whether it was going to be part of a criminal investigation. They needed to to double check some things, they would get back to me. Um, and eventually they did and said, okay, we, we know it's old, but um, we, we, there's nothing we can do with it. So we're gonna inter it, which was a new word for me. I had to look that up and that meant we bury. I'm thinking, okay. So I rang them back and said, look, I need to come and collect this somehow. Can I, can I come and get it? And they said, absolutely not, sir. No, this is, this is not for you. So uh, I was a bit stuck. So um, I asked a couple of friends, I need some help, what can we do? And I was put in contact with um, a lovely lady called Natalie, who I noticed came on earlier, so hi Nat. Um, Natalie from Thames Discovery, who was really the saviour in all of this. Um, and she took it upon herself to go into the police station and collect it on behalf of Thames Discovery, which was great, um, meant that the skull was safe. Um, and then a couple of months later, she, she just suggested to me, you know, we should go back and see if there's any more. Uh, we had to wait for the right low tide, um, went back and had a look in that area. Not really much to see. So we did a little bit of investigation and found a bone sticking up out of the mud. Natalie was convinced it was human. I really have no idea. It's not my field of expertise. So we started to investigate more, found some ribs and uh, found <clears throat> um, a hip bone. And we just realized this is the rest of it. So we backfilled it, came back the next day with her entire team, and we, we uncovered the rest of, of the body. We were very fortunate enough to actually recover 98% of the body. Uh, it was quite a hard task because whilst we're, we're doing the excavation, there's clippers, the, these are the Thames boats, rushing up and down, and the weight from these boats is, is incredible. It will knock you off your feet. So you can imagine we're, we're handfuls of 
little bones and trying to, you know, pick them up and the wash is coming over us, we're all getting soaking wet. And so it was quite incredible really that we managed to recover so much. Um, uh, quite a few months later, um, um, they did a carbon-14 test and we got the results back as <clears throat> the, the date uh, of being around 1730 which meant, yeah, it gave us a date. Um, also the fact that it was a girl as well, which I'd ha actually just had my, my first daughter at that time. So it was a little bit of like a, you know, a strange time for me to kind of get my head around what I'd found. Um, um, the fact that she had died most likely from malnutrition. She suffered from rickets and tooth decay. Um, so she probably had quite an unfortunate life. Unfortunately, it was quite common for kids in that, during that time to suffer from malnutrition. Um, we knew she was buried because there was a grave cut. She was buried with her head towards the foreshore and her feet out into the water. Um, so in this next part of the presentation, we just wanted to share some of the fascinating gold artifacts which have been found uh, by ourselves and by other mudlarks. Um, we do have a very tight-knit community here in London, and it's really great uh, we all like to share each other's finds and, and see what everybody else has found. It's very extremely rare, as I mentioned previously, to find anything gold on the foreshore. Uh, so don't get too excited, but we did want to share some of the most spectacular finds uh, that have been found by various mudlarks uh, over the past few years, well, decades. Uh, so this is a Celtic gold stator that was found by uh, Ollie Clark. Uh, this, again, uh, dates to the, the late Iron Age period uh, in Britain. And this is also before London actually existed. Uh, there were different settlements that, that uh, were along the river, but no large settlements uh, like what the Romans established back in 43 AD. Uh, there were different tribes that lived along the river. And also the River Thames was a boundary between different Celtic tribes that lived north and south of the river. Uh, and this coin just illustrates that they were active in terms of trading, um, using money at that time period uh, back in the late Iron Age. Uh, this is a recent find that came up um, just late last year, early this year. This was found by Mateus, and uh, it's a beautiful piece of, uh, it's an actual bead uh, it made of very filigree gold, and you can see the twisted wire that's been applied to the outer surface of this gorgeous bead, and it's hollow on the inside, slightly crushed when he found it, uh, but in beautiful mint condition. Uh, and this was recently in the press um, and in the local news. Another beautiful find uh, that was found by our friend Tony Tira uh, is this beautiful Tudor lace shape. This was uh, sewn onto uh, either the end of, of, a, of a, um, a leather strap or a string, or also, uh, it, sorry, I'll just move on to this slide. Uh, you can see in this photo, this historic painting on the left-hand side, uh, the sleeve, and this is a zoom-in picture of these lace shapes that were sewn onto Tudor garments. So not only were they wearing uh, beautiful fabrics of many different types of materials, but they were also um, using gold to complement those fabrics and also enhance those. Just going back to this photo, this is uh, some of the best uh, uh, Tudor gold finds that have been uh, located, discovered here uh, in London along the foreshore. And you can just see the intricacy of these uh, little small tubes that have been um, beautifully, wonderfully created using so small pieces of gold. As mudlarks, we sometimes find rings. Um, mo more often than not, they'll be just modern copper alloy. Victorian, if we're lucky, if we're really lucky, we can find something that's a little bit older. So this particular ring um, is called a morning ring. But what's so interesting is all the information on the inside. We have the legend TW, which I believe was the deceased's initials. And we also have um, um, OBT, which is an abbreviation of the Latin obit, meaning died. And that's dated 31st of October, 1701. So we know that was the date that this particular person died. Um, A-E-T-A -E is from the Latin um, a, uh, meaning basically lifetime and, and it has 80 there so suggesting that the person was 80 which for 1701 80 was a pretty pretty incredible age um, so whether he was somebody that was you know very wealthy or just happened to live to the ripe old age of 80 we will never know 
so this is a picture that I took of um, a collection of rings made by uh, the legend that is uh, a guy called Woolidge John, who um, yeah, has found some incredible things over the years. And he just gave me a bag of rings one day and said, oh, you might want to photograph them. And as I went through them, that ring in the middle, the Clockwork Orange ring, I, I just was blown away by that image. So I thought, OK, I can see a picture now in my mind. Yeah, there we go. So that again, that, so as I mentioned earlier, we do find rings. They're mostly, you know, you know, uh, sort of costume jewellery, not made of precious metal. So that is a really good sort of cross cross section of, of what we ex expect to find in terms of rings on the foreshore. This is a ring that I found under a bridge in West London. And again, I think it was probably just slung into the river, tears coming down the woman's face as she just disposed and discarded this into the river, just out of desperation and frustration. The beautiful thing about this ring is um, the diamond is actually not a diamond. This is an aquamarine gemstone and it's been carved in the shape of a heart and uh, sailors have always uh, preferred aquamarine gemstones because they're supposed to have supernatural powers to protect them when they're out, out on sea so I can just imagine that it was a sailor that purchased this for his sweetheart it's obviously an engagement ring um, and maybe he never came back uh, from his long journey or he was mischievous when he was on his long trips abroad, uh, and therefore she slung this into the river uh, in frustration or um, heartbroken, actually. Okay, and then just moving on to um, a project that me and Jason and uh, Steve Brooker are working on, um, which is this idea of the Thames Museum. So this idea was born shortly after we finished filming uh, the 2013 um, series of Mud Men. And then very early on when we uh, met with Jason for the first time and realised he was an architect, um, you know, the three of us, we could maybe try and bring this idea to life. Um, the idea, basically, is that we all have collections, all mudlarks have got massive collections that mostly sit under our beds and cupboards and under the stairs, never get to see the light of day. There's only a small proportion of our finds that ever get to be seen in the museums, and they tend to like, you know, the really shiny, important things. However, a lot of what we find are really the everyday items owned by everyday Londoners and really that's where the stories are that's where the interesting stories are so the idea is to tell the story of London through the finds made by us mudlarks and the idea is it's a museum that could change twice a day because there are two tides each day so there's two opportunities every day to add to the museum's collection and, and possibly change history. What we'd like to do is uh, really uh, bring in the larger artifacts into the museum as well. So a lot of the uh, cranes and old uh, construction, dock working and uh, wharves, warehouse, those materials are still kind of rotting away and rusting away along the foreshore. So what we'd like to do is take some of these old cranes and just um, salvage all of these artifacts, both large and small, and put them on display in the museum on multiple levels and just make it uh, very much like you're going back in time to the Elizabethan, to the Georgian, to the Victorian docks during that time period. So that's just a quick summary of the architectural vision for the museum. If you want any more information about um, our, our museum and also there's a contact uh, page on there as well, please go to thamesmuseum.org to find out more. And then in August of 2018, Jason and I were, were approached by Shire Books, uh, that's a subsidiary of, of Bloomsbury Publishing. Um, they wanted to produce a, a book on mudlarking, uh, but they really wanted to produce an, a, a really uh, heavy illustrated book. Loads and loads of pictures, which um, obviously as a photographer, I was more than happy to, to dive in and, and, and contribute my skills to that. Um, so Jason and I have been busy over the last uh, 16 months putting together all the text and the images and it's all going through very well and uh, so we now have a pencil date uh, for February next year um, where the book will come out February 25th so yeah it's available for pre-order now it's on Amazon uh, at a very modest pilot price of £9.99 um, so thanks for listening everyone thank you